Hey everybody, Lee Orff here. Time for a little Q and A. A couple of weeks ago, about a month ago actually, I came on here and sort of gave you a brief update. I hadn't been putting too much here on the channel because conferences have been pretty much uh, canceled, and my stuff doesn't tend to do too well with Zoom conferences with all my animations. So things have been happening, and today I'm going to answer some questions. Um, I was going to give you sort of an update on my basic research plan, but I think I'll save that for later because I've got some cool stuff coming down the pipe. It's not 100% official yet, and I'd kind of like to just wait until that's official before I talk about it. So I'll just dive right into the questions. So starting out with uh, the question about correlation between updraft of a supercell and um, and lightning activity, cloud to ground lightning activity. Is there a relationship, say, between um, how much lightning is occurring or the rate of flashes and the strength of the storm? Let's just sort of rephrase that question there. Um, maybe um, one of the things lightning is kind of outside of my my wheelhouse, as it were. Um, there is research into lightning and there is certainly motivation into trying to find out whether lightning flash rates can be, uh, related to actual physics going on near the ground, winds, rain, hail, et cetera. And in, in, in the question you're asking is whether there's perhaps a relationship between the strength of the updraft or the width of the updraft and lightning rates. So probably, maybe, who knows? Um, it's, <laughs> I know it sounds like a bad answer, but, um, lightning's kind of, Lightning flashes are good, a general indicator of activity, strong updrafts, ice processes in the cloud, grapple formation. So, I mean, when you see a lot of lightning, it usually correlates to a strong storm, but it doesn't have to be, as far as I know, uh, related to the width of the updraft. There, it's Again, there's research being done on, on things like what determines the width of the updraft of a supercell, for sure. Um, it's just outside of my area. So, um, yeah. It's it's a good question, very good question, and um, a, an ob observational meteorologist might do better to answer that. Other question, do my simulations, regardless of resolution, show any changes in the characteristics of the streamwise vorticity current or the rate of vorticity aggregation or other interesting features as the supercell cycles? So what's the sensitivity to resolution is kind of the question, or is there one? And the answer is, of course, there is. One of the things that makes the research I do significant is that I'm running at resolutions that are very high compared to most of what you'll see in the published literature. I'm able to do this because I'm running on supercomputers and I've done a lot of work to make data manageable so I can conduct these simulations. So yeah, there is. And if you think back to the, the simulation that sort of started this research in, in the BAMS paper, the SVC looks kind of laminar, kind of smooth in many of the animations you'll see. That's for the 30 meter run that we originally did. Now, when you go and start looking at things at say 15 meters, 20 meters, 10 meters, there's still something that I would call an SVC present, but it's much more turbulent. It's much more finely resolved. So we end up with an SVC that is all kind of broken down into turbulent vortices and it's not as smooth and laminar looking as the 30 meter SVC with, um, with the Smagorinsky turbulence closure. Actually, there's other things that uh, seem to modulate the, the structure of the SVC in terms of its turbulent structure. You know, so the question is, you know, uh, what's the right answer, right? If, you know, what is the SVC supposed to look like, et cetera, et cetera? Well, we're just starting to uh, find these in nature. So um, we'll know what the what it's supposed to look like soon, I hope, or at least to some extent. Um, there's a lot of fine scale activity that you just don't see when you run it at a lower resolution. Certainly the tornado structure is very sensitive to the resolution at, say, the difference between 30 meters and 10 meters. That's huge, um, and that's expected because of the the scale you're talking about with tornadic vortices and subvortices and suction vortices being dozens of diameters, dozens of meters in diameter. Then yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be sensitive to that. So uh, the main answer to your question at this point is the the SVC at least looks more turbulent. There's still that flow from the from the forward flank coming up and around and being ingested into the updraft, just like we've seen since the simulations in the 80s. That that forward flank ingestion and the what's responsible for the low level 
um, updraft for the low-level mesocyclone. That stuff is basically the same. It's just that now that we're focusing it with such high resolution, new structures kind of just make themselves visible in the data. And again, as scientists, we try to categorize these things. And then, of course, per, you know, if you're a simulating uh, simulator, uh, computational meteorologist like I am, you have to go to the observationalist to figure out what's really going on. So that's still work in progress, but it's very exciting because the discovery of the SVC has led to field programs where they're now finding them. And that's quite cool in my, in my opinion. Um, question about releasing devices such as what was done in Twister. Is that a real thing? So if you're thinking of like the Dorothy thing where they re released the small probes into the updraft, you know, I have to say in 2021, that is becoming closer to reality perhaps than it certainly was back when the movie was made. So that was kind of a, a forward thinking approach. Probes are getting smaller. We're using drones now. Of course, you're controlling them. They're not automatic, or though they can be, they certainly can't automate. There's usually somebody with a master control, but yes, they, they can do that sort of thing. So there's more in situ, which is just a fancy way of saying sampling the data with the device while you're there, as opposed to, say, radar or satellite. But in situ measurements are super important. You cannot measure things like temperature and pressure remotely. Um, not in a thunderstorm, maybe, you know, you could use infrared radiation to measure the tops of the sun thunderstorms temperature pretty well, but not near the ground. So these things are, uh, are coming about now with, with drones. So something that's even smaller than a drone, something that may be able to self-organize and maybe fly around. Well, that's a bit on the edge of it for today's, uh, science and technology, but I, you know, you got it in, in Twister, the, the, the things just got sucked up. You know, I think they were just being drawn into the updraft. They, they form tracers in that case. Well, p part of the issue is you really don't want to release them right into the updraft. We already know where they're going to go up and around. You sort of want to go out, in, in my opinion, more useful deploy, deployment of, of these probes would be further out, say, far field in the forward flank or whatever to see how the air you know, moves around from, from, from a distance, not just throw them into the updraft and watch them go up, which is cool. And it would be fun to measure say updraft velocities directly. That's something um, I'm not sure has been done. It's difficult to measure updrafts. Uh, it's much easier to measure horizontal winds with radar, for instance, or at least get a sense of the strongest rotation, the radial velocities. Um, so anyway, yeah, I ramble. Um, this is not, happening right now like Twister, but we're getting closer to that. And I think miniaturization is going to be huge. And I know that there are uh, like neutral balloon launch type things where you've got a little probe just kind of drifting into the cloud. That's also uh, an approach that's being used today. So yeah, we're getting closer to that, but we're not quite there. And of course, Hollywood is Hollywood. You're, you know, it's got to look good. Um, the scientific payload is probably going to be greater by deploying them in a slightly different manner. Um, the, the modern version of what is of, of Twister, I guess the closest thing that would come to that is a, prog a program called Taurus, T O R U S. Um, that's being it's sponsored by the National Science Foundation, and it involves looking for uh, small scale features in supercells using um, drones and other, uh, other in situ approaches. Uh, a comment more than a question it fascinates me that we build try to build all this stuff to predict weather, but we aren't trying to build shelters for our children. And I might add to that comment or our adults for that matter. Uh, I think what you're getting at here is the fact that it doesn't really take a whole lot of effort to protect people from tornadoes in the sense that you just go underground. <laughs> so you have to have a hole ready, I guess is, is, is the problem. Um, I agree in principle. I think that when you look at the most vulnerable pe people in our society, people who are poor, people who live in manufactured homes, for instance, in trailer parks, it doesn't take a whole lot of wind to do some serious damage. And if you've got nowhere to go, what are you going to do? What can you do, right? What can you actually, what action can you take to save your own life if there's no shelter? Um, I can't imagine being in a situation like that. Um, I have a basement, at least here I am, you know, I'd probably be pretty safe here in Wisconsin, although a uh, EF five could probably do me in, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I agree. Uh, infrastructure is a big issue in this country in a lot of ways, but I do think that uh, it wouldn't take a whole lot of effort. I don't know who'd pay for it, but it seems like if, if, if trailer parks had 
It doesn't have to be too too elaborate. Just a, a, a storm shelter, just a place where people can cram in and and hide for you know ten fifteen minutes of time while the storm passes. So I'd like to see that as well. Um, okay, question question. Ah, yes, good old May thirty first. Have I done any more studying? On the May 31st, 2013 El Reno tornado. I heard that you studied it before. I'm curious if you found something else from it recently. That tornado has always fascinated me. Well, it's fascinated many of us. Um, May 31st, 2013 was a very unusual storm. And as such, it is difficult to simulate. Um, what I found in my work you know, it was only, we've only simulated tornadoes and supercells for not that long, really. The work that was done in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, early 2000s, we had things you'd call tornadoes, but they were marginally resolved. Sometimes we call them tornado-like vortices. Um, so I just wanted to sort of put that up front. This whole process that I've been doing where you're just simulating supercells and producing these pretty well resolved, highly, you know, when you animate them, you can see all the frames. That's kind of new. That's um, so just starting out with that. So, yes, I have tried to simulate that storm, but I knew ahead. I knew when I even started using my normal approach that it probably wasn't going to um, to look like the real storm with 24 May 2011. That was in a different kind of environment with um and the yes, it sort of congealed into a line of storms, but the cell was kind of isolated. And it, unlike uh, 31 May, let's take a look at that. Let's let's look at some radar. So this is from I forget where I got this from, but it shows some of the positions of the research radars for 31 May. But you'll also see the reflectivity. and And the point I want to make here is if you watch the evolution of this storm. Um, it starts out as a line of cells. So like pausing right about here, for instance, um, you know, this is before we have our bizarre mesocyclone descending to the ground with tentacles everywhere tornado. Um, this is just as the cells are initiating. You'll notice that there's a line of cells. I count one, two, three, four, five, six cells in a line. Um, five, I guess, if you let that isolated one out. So this is, you know, this is before the tornado, but this is how the storm started. Now, when I start simulations, when I start a simulation in CM1, the model I'm using, such as with the 24 May storm that you're familiar with, I start it in a very simple manner. I just have a nice uh, isolated blob of air that is rises and pushes upwards. It's very symmetric and it kicks off the cloud and onward it goes and it forms the supercell. Now there's been research done on this and it should be probably relatively self-evident though, that how you start a storm is going to lead to how it, how it, the result that lead that the result, the, the actual simulation, the initial conditions, uh, you feel those initial conditions long into the simulation. In fact, small changes at the beginning of the simulation lead to big changes later on. That's, sort of a fundamental problem of prediction is, is what it really is. So anyway, we're already starting out with this sort of bizarre thing. So if you're asking me, how do you, how, what's the right way to simulate 31 May? I'd say, try to start it like this, like you see in this radar image. And I can do that. I can start a line of cells. I just haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, so let's just watch this, um, watch this, the actual observations of this storm as it, as it evolves. So that line of cells sort of, um, it's almost like one of the supercells eats the other ones, and then boom, you've got your giant monster uh, El Reno storm that we're familiar with, with its you know giant tornado with sub vortices that were essentially tornadoes, and they're all whipping around like a carousel of doom. And some of the tornadoes inside the big tornado have sub vortices. It, it you know Josh Worman wrote a paper about that in BAMS. It's it's worth reading. Um, but anyway, yeah. So I have not gotten that to happen, but I will show you what I have gotten to happen. So I have simulated this, this, a storm in this environment using my, the, the typical approach of horizontally homogeneous base state, start with a per perturbation, a, a symmetric perturbation, just get the cloud going. And I get something that is, it's a supercell. Um, it's definitely looks something like, uh, the real storm, but so what you're seeing in this image here is, um, the red field is the updraft, 
and the blue field is a downdraft. So we're seeing updrafts and downdrafts in the in the ISO surfaces, those three dimensional uh, features. On the ground, we see the cold pool. Um, the blue is where the cold air is, and the green air ahead, and and the warmer colors are ahead of the storm. So it's like the environment ahead of the storm versus the storm's cold pool itself. Um, and in this uh, at this at this time, you'll just see there's there's a pretty strong. You can see the mesocyclone in the updraft ISO surface, and you see some sporadic downdrafts in dark blue. Um, so we will uh, put this into motion, and you'll see as it goes along, um, there's kind of a pulse. You see the downdraft kind of lower to the ground, and you start to see these little vortices uh, fire up along a boundary within the cold pool, which is probably what would be called the left flank convergence boundary. This is a new term, relatively new term. Um, think of it as a boundary within the cold pool, but it's not the forward or rear flank uh, gust front. So it's kind of halfway between them. And, and you see these boundaries uh, kind of form in both observational data and in simulation data. So right at this point here, you have this, uh, a whole bunch of tiny vortices all sort of amplifying due to stretching. It has to be stretching uh, a vorticity by the updraft as it lowers. Exactly what's causing this updraft to strengthen and exactly what's causing this all, you know, that, that hasn't been determined. But the, the point I'd like to make here is this is not the storm <laughs> that happened. Okay, and I'll continue with this animation. And you'll see something that looks like, kind of like a tornado form. It's kind of small. It gets, it gets pulled into the cold air, and then you have this huge downdrafts forming everywhere, and go, it's all gone. Um, so, and I'll, I'll let this run from a different angle so you can watch it again. The, uh, the transparent ice surface you see is a pressure perturbation ice surface. So that's low pressure. So there is something going on with a little blob of low pressure that kind of seems to merge in with the main updraft. And there you are with your line of vortices. Um, and you see that in the 24 May simulation a lot as the tornado forms and, and as it evolves. But in this one, uh, everything kind of gets, uh, gets sort of the updraft is sort of into the cold pool now it's sucking up cold air it's probably not uh it, it's it's a rough version of that storm it, it happened in an environment that was nearby at least the environment we sampled but it's not the storm so this one's going to take more work i question how valuable it is um well i shouldn't say that I think we already know in this game in this severe storms game and in the modeling game that um we're going to get a much different result if we if we try to uh, initialize the storm differently, and we might get something that looks more like that storm. That would be useful, um, but I, I kind of already think we know to some extent that there are boundaries and there are mergers and there's things that can happen that can that obviously can lead to strengthening or weakening, constructive or destructive uh, interference. You can sort of think of it as. Um, and it would be a nice result to get that big tornado to form and sort of explore why. Um, and that is something that is on my list. I'm also looking for uh, sampling some other, getting some other soundings to initialize the model from that area because there's multiple places you can sample. So um, anyway, th that storm will continue to be simulated. I have funding to actually look at that one and some other storms, um, but uh, it's still early days. And and I and again, you, you want to be careful. You don't want to spend all your life trying to do one thing just to get it right. There's got to be a good scientific uh, result for doing it. Um, I am interested in doing more work with uh, more complex initialization in introducing boundaries into simulations where they don't exist to try to mimic what happens with storms where uh, an outflow boundary is impacts the storm or pre-existing boundary from an earlier storm in the day gets drawn into the storm's updraft. I, I really think that in reality, that's what leads to some of these bizarre storms where, uh, where for instance, you know, Joplin just kind of comes, descends, and, and does its thing. It's over really fast. Um, there's other other historical tornadoes that have done things like that. Uh, Gerald, Texas was a weird one. Oof. Um, you know, so you've got these outlier storms, and they um, – they deserve a lot of, of focus, but they're outliers. And, you know, the conditions that lead to those are probably pretty weird, uh, but important to understand. And, yeah, predicting, I can't even imagine trying to predict that storm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, there's just so much going on. Uh, even in real time, you know, people had problems with that one. Okay, um, more questions. Questions about... Uh, how okay? So nuts and bolts questions about HPC large scale data analysis. Um, how do I do it? Uh, and you mentioned Slurm. 
and Docker Swarm and some other things like that. Yeah, you know, sometime I might just do, I might just show you my desktop as I sort of meander around on the supercomputer. So I use what's called a VNC to access the supercomputer. That basically gives me a desktop with windows and stuff that I can manipulate. It's much faster than just logging in and, and trying to display things the traditional way we do. Um, so I use a VNC, all secure, secure shell, et cetera, to get into the machine. Okay, I'm on the machine. I'm logged in. Everything's done at the command line with terminals. Um, I have scripts. Yes, there's Slurm. Slurm is a, a job manager. It basically controls, you know, the queue. You know, you, you submit a job to the queue. You get in line, and you wait your turn. Your job runs. You know, the, the Slurm handles all that. There's so yeah, that's what we're using on on the Frontera supercomputer at the Texas Advanced Computing Center in Austin, Texas. TAC. That's the machine that uh, is the uh, leadership class NSF sponsored machine in the United States. Um, so yeah, it's 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 Slurm. Uh, it's all Linux. You know, Linux is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, it's without Linux, I don't know where I'd be. <laughs> Everything I've done since the '90s has been with Linux. Um, and what else can I say? We use the Intel Fortran compiler. The CM1 model is written in Fortran, so essentially it's this big Fortran model. You compile it. You uh, make a binary. You submit your your Slurm script, which tells it how to partition the job. How many how many nodes do you need on the machine? So you have to be very careful and and specify very clearly exactly what you need on the supercomputer. So my big simulations will take up more nodes, but I have to map them just right. Um, so there's a lot of configuration issues that go along with this. But uh, essentially, yeah, it's it's like any other supercomputer. But if you've never been on one, you you wouldn't know. It's all command line and it's all uh, jobs that you submit. And then there's the post-processing, and I've spent a ton of work on post-processing. And again, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole, but my post-processing code is mostly C and Python, and um, and I have my own way of doing things, lots of shell scripting. Um, but it's all all my entire workflow is designed to manage huge amounts huge amounts of data that have been saved at very high temporal resolution and spatial resolution. But the temporal resolution is what makes my work I think more significant because I've I can save data as as frequently as every model time step, and that gives you um, some more options on how to analyze data and and other things. Okay, other questions. This is fun. Um, Oh, comparing the, okay, nuts and bolts about the simulation algorithms. So, and how does it compare to, say, Hollywood special effects? That's a great question. Um, my advisor, my PhD advisor at the University of Wisconsin, where I currently work, but I went to school here too, was his name was John Anderson. He is, uh, he works for Google now, but he worked for Industrial Light and Magic in, uh, I guess, the late 90s, early 2000s, and then worked for Pixar for a long time. So uh, why am I telling you this? Well, John's sensibilities for for making things look really good and simulated high resolution definitely uh, uh, wore off on me, you might say. Um, but I want to make a distinction here. Hollywood special effects are designed to blow your mind, okay? They're not always designed to look physically correct. Sometimes they are, in fact, designed to make to look physically correct. For instance, the movie that uh, one of John's movies that he worked on was The Perfect Storm. And his work can be seen in the, the big ocean waves as the storm as the storm kicks in, and you're seeing these huge waves, these huge swells. That's a ocean model. It's a probably a, shallow, a deep water ocean model with periodic boundary conditions where you're just uh, solving for the, the the surface of the water. Uh, then you you ladle on a whole bunch of cool special effects like waves and stuff, and that stuff probably has some physics in it too. But the point I want to make here about Hollywood special effects versus what you see when I am showing you my movies is that the the stuff I'm showing you is, is supposed to be kind of agnostic, right? It's just supposed to show you what's going on. I'm not trying to convince you of anything necessarily. I am using choices in when I choose my rendering parameters on what of, of how I want to show the data. And yes, there's a lot of subjectivity in that, but I'm generally not just trying to make it look cool. I'm trying to eke some science out of here. Now, when you do things like the perfect storm, you want it to look like a real ocean. And yeah, you use a physical model to do that. But some of the some of the special effects, like you think of lightsabers or things that don't really exist in reality, warp drive, all that fun stuff that we all love, but it's all nonsense, lovely nonsense. Then your special effects, you can do however you want. There's, there's really no physical laws because you're making up your own physics. Um, so anyway, I will say that both processes, whether you're 
rendering frames from a, a scientific application or something that's designed for Hollywood, it takes a lot of computing power. Um, believe me, they've got they've got render farms that they use in Hollywood or in the movie industry that are quite uh, comparable, I would imagine, to some of the stuff that we use to do science uh, in the United States. So um, anyway, yeah, there is there is a lot of physics in that, but there's but it doesn't have to be. It just has to sell and look good and get people in the movie theater. So there's different motivations. I'm I'm interested in understanding how stuff works. You know, even if I come up with an answer that's that I don't like, it's just the way it is when you do science. Um, okay, Pilger and El Reno. Okay, Pilger. I I, I have tried Pilger that environment again. I got a, a supercell that just kind of dies, it goes up and goes down. It's like a pulsing supercell, <laughs> and that's not what happened. So that one's another very strange condition. Um, again, you got the approach I use is sort of best designed for uh, uh, isolated supercells. It um, because of just the way the models constructed and the assumptions that go into it, you can do things that are more complex, are, are more sophisticated. But uh, the approach I use is we're still there's still enough to be, to learn about individual supercells. That part of me is hesitant to make it more complex than it already is because it's already so complex. So, um, but Pilger is on my radar. But there's other storms that'll probably uh, have have higher precedence because it's another one of those weird weird storms. In other words, some of the scientific payload doesn't always correspond to the the actual impact that happened on humanity. Some storms that are boring you never heard of have been studied an awful lot, um, but, but they didn't necessarily do much. Um, okay, let's see. Am I going to stick with 30-meter simulations going forward to save on the terabytes, or do you think there's another reason for doing 10 meters in the future? Another great question related to resolution. Um, the answer is... I'm going to focus on both. Okay. The 30 meter simulations in my scientific opinion are high enough to do good science on storm structure and, and causality between things like SVCs and tornadoes. The tornado that forms in the 30 meter simulation is not quite resolved as well as we know it can be because when we run it 20 and 15 meters, we get a more complex structure that looks more like a real observed, say multiple vortex tornado or say something um, that was run at a high resolution in a chamber model. So there's reasons to continue to push the resolution barrier the, or boundary, keep on running at higher resolution. Although it does, it's a valid question to ask is, you know, is there a point of diminishing returns? Do we need to keep doing this? Yeah, I say yes. Partly because of the tornado. The tornado itself is still, there's still things we can resolve better with regards to how the tornado works. Um, by increasing the resolution, we can we can do better things, say, with the surface of the earth and in, in, improve the way that we handle the surface boundary conditions. We can include things like trees and stuff down the road. We're not there yet. Um, I am toying around with some wind engineer modeling approaches, but we're just not there yet. Um, so yeah, we still need to push the resolution barrier. However, for basic science, no, you don't need to run all your simulations at 10, not even 30. You can get a lot done at 50 or a hundred, but if you're doing tornado work, I, 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 I get, I get nervous, anything, uh, less resolved than a hundred meters and that's even pushing it. Um, but you know, that's, there's things that you simply the model cannot conceive of when you run at lower resolution because it just doesn't have uh, it's on a grid that doesn't contain those the higher resolution so it all just kind of gets shoved into what's called the subgrid turbulence parameterization uh, it gets turned into sort of a turbulent kinetic energy and like okay well there's this much turbulent kinetic energy in this grid zone now when you run at higher resolution you actually resolve the the turbulence and that turbulent kinetic energy term goes smaller and smaller because you're actually resolving it. So that's the thing that always strikes me when I do these simulations is that, yeah, uh, higher and higher resolution, you I mean, you're explicitly resolving things that are just parameterized at lower resolution or just estimated, shall we say. You can't get something from nothing, okay? You just can't. So uh, resolution matters. But there is a point at which you have to ask how much really matters, and it depends on what you're trying to, the questions you're trying to answer. Um, question about warnings. What's the next step in your mind for severe weather warnings? Um, uh, more lead time, more accurate. Do you think your simulation work could be used in real time someday in the far future if computers are power enough 
and get enough data. Yeah, that's a big if, but and those are all great points. And I would say, yeah, that's both of those things are things I'm interested in seeing. And any supercell researcher, you know, the motivation for the work that, that we all do, whether you're a field meteorologist or a computational meteorologist like me, I mean, the overarching goal is to predict these things better. Um, it's hard to predict supercells. It's hard to predict their path. It's hard to predict whether they're going to produce a tornado or not. We just, we're not there. Um, just last night here in Wisconsin, we had uh, something that looked like it might be a derecho, a line of storms that, you know, I would call it a squall line. I'm not sure I really call it a derecho, but, you know, even something with a simpler convective mode, as we say in, the, in, in meteorology, it was really, even up to 12 hours before this event, it wasn't quite sure how it was going to work itself out. You know, people around here were worrying about, you know, getting up in the middle of the night and dealing with damage. As it turned out, you know, no, a couple trees down, you know, in, in, in an adjacent city. I don't think any tornadoes were observed yesterday um, in Wisconsin. Anyway, my point is... Um, we have a lot of improving we can do in all our forecasting for severe weather. Everyone knows it, and it's not like it's a conspiracy or anything. It's a hard problem. Um, I have the luxury as a just a pure scientist of just studying this stuff in in my own time, not having to actually run simulations in real time and then make predictions from them. And that's what the operational meteorologists do. And to me, that's even a harder job, and it's got more stress associated with it because – um, you've got to make a decision. You've got to make a call and that, you know, you might make the wrong call. You issue a warning, nothing happens. I mean, okay. It happens all the time. It's because it's a hard problem. Um, I mean, you don't want to miss a warning when a tornado forms and the, and the weather service didn't issue anything. So of, yes, we definitely, um, that's the overarching long-term goal in the short term. It's just understanding how supercells work better. Um, we still lack knowledge about the fine details of what happens in the supercell that results in long path tornadoes, long track tornadoes, strong tornadoes, even weak tornadoes. And we all want to predict it better. We all want to be able to say when we issue a tornado warning that we're, you know, we have 80% confidence that the tornado is going to begin at between, you know, within a five minute range, it's going to travel towards the Northeast at, you know, 35 knots and it's going to hit the Southern part of this town and then if we can do that and do it accurately, that changes things tremendously, not only by improving the accuracy of your forecast by, you know, where the path of the storm is, but also by providing more lead time. And those two things will happen together. They almost have to. Um, that is the, the main goal. I mean, if we could do an hour in advance, then that's actually something that is been on the table you know there's we want to be able to predict an hour in advance tornadoes and we can't do it now we can't predict them a half hour in advance we you know we can predict to some extent but we'll give false alarms some storms don't produce tornadoes that look like they will and some that don't look like they will occasionally we do so it's a hard problem and only by understanding how these storms work will we be able to predict them better is how i look at it so yes but it's a long-term goal, and it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of comp computation, a lot of field study. <laughs> Boy, I know it's, I sound like we haven't made any progress, but we have. And I say we as the, the scientific community has made tremendous progress in understanding storms. But there's still some really fundamental questions that we haven't answered yet. And that's what makes it fun to be a scientist. So anyway, <laughs> keeps me out of trouble for the most part. Uh, yeah, I look forward to a day, by the way, where – you're assimilating data from radar and maybe uh, an advanced uh, mesonet and satellite data. It's all just churning in, coming into some uh, assimilation process where you basically take that data, get it into a computer, massage it so that it, a model can use it and forecast the future. I mean, we do that now, today. It's just done on a longer time scale, generally speaking, uh, and at a resolution that's not going to resolve tornadoes. So again, this is an exciting time right now because we've got these different approaches, different hardware. We've got machine learning going on now. We've got GPUs running models. You know, we've got the hardware landscape has shifted a, a little bit. So there's, it's an inter interesting time. And I can, I can certainly imagine that in 30, 40 years or so, um, it's just going to be a lot, uh, a lot better. Our predictions are going to be a lot better and more specific and, and more lead time. But 
mm, I don't know if there was some breakthrough we could have that just made the prediction problem easier. If there's something we can key in on of a, for observing a supercell with remote sensing technology that says with confidence that it's, yes, it's going to produce a tornado or not, or a strong one or a weak one. If, 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 you know, that's what we're all looking for, whether you're an operational meteorologist or a researcher who does uh, field work, or if, if you're a, um, a computational guy like me or a theoretician, we're all looking for these answers. Um, I'm not so sure we're going to find the simple answers we're all hoping are out there, but that's, again, what, what makes it fun. Okay, let's see other questions here. Um, some questions on machine learning. So... Yeah, it's early days with regards to, say, the atmospheric and earth sciences and the usefulness of machine learning and um, AI. You know, it kind of all goes in the same bucket in my mind. This isn't work that I'm currently engaged in. I'm certainly paying attention to the work in this area. Um, there's going to be more and more of it, uh, especially there's certain aspects, at least with models, that I'm aware of where you can make some pretty good improvements in, uh, in, in the time it takes to run the model if you can use a machine learning algorithm. So we're training some machine learning, learning algorithms to do things that would normally take a whole lot of computational time on a standard computer. So we can sort of take bites out of the computationally intensive stuff, replace it with something that is machine learning based, hoping that it's not, this kind of freaks me out a little bit, by the way, because machine learning, I mean, once you understand how it works, it's, it's okay, but it's still black box-ish black box -ish to me, and I'm, I'm a little concerned that we're going to get a little too reliant on these without really knowing how they work. But then again, look at the Wharf model or any model, ask any meteorologist how it all works, and they're not going to be able to tell you, you know, all the details. So, but anyway, I digress. Machine learning is already becoming a big topic of study in, in the physical sciences and in a lot of areas. There's money for it to do research on it. Um, and I am certainly interested in, in using it once other people have worked out some of the issues because um, it takes data science and other things that are outside of my wheelhouse to do right. And um, again, I'm kind of on the sidelines. I've got an analysis approach for the work I'm doing now that I'm satisfied with. It's based on physics only. And, you know, it works for me for now. But when it comes to prediction, oh, yeah, we'll be using machine learning. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind. When it, anything that comes with getting things done faster, you're going to use whatever shortcuts. And when I say shortcut, that's a loaded word. You're going to use whatever techniques you can that are, that are, tech, that are um, computationally um, inexpensive, I guess you could say. Um, one more question before we wrap things up. Um, Let's see. Oh, what kind of air are my simulated storms encountering ahead of them? Uh, is the data, uh, do I use near storm data to get uh, the storm running and then let it run into uniform air? So what I do is the model boundary of the storm that is coming into the model's domain because we're moving with the storm is the sounding. It's, it's the initial conditions. So yeah, basically it's the initial conditions before the storm even kicks off. It's that air. You're just feeding it with that same air. So, and that's a, an important thing. Again, it comes down to the assumption built into the kind of model that CM1 is, where you start out with your base state, your, your environment, your pre-storm environment has no horizontal variations. In other words, it doesn't matter where you are in that domain, 120 kilometers on a side, if it's the winds, the humidity, or whatnot, it's only a function of how high above the ground you are. So it starts out only a function of height. Then you start your storm going, and then everything does its thing. Um, but yeah, you, you can introduce things through model boundaries, and that's when I start doing work on trying to understand more complex storms like maybe uh, El Reno 2013 or Pilger, or uh, you know, I might want to start introducing boundaries into the storm to see what happens when a storm gobbles up a pre-existing boundary. I'm pretty sure you can probably have a something stream-YZ vorticity current out there. You know, have have a, an old gust front that's still, you know, got a little bit of momentum going on. And if you were to tug on it horizontally 
from a strong updraft, you could stretch it and maybe intensify it. And that, if the SVC is is as important to the updraft morphology as my research suggests that it is, then it doesn't necessarily matter the source of the rotation of the vorticity. It's just that it's there. Um, in my case, the storm I'm simulating, it the storm produces it itself via thermodynamic processes occurring when the rain melt, the rain evaporates and the hail melts and such, and it produces these thermal boundaries that themselves produce horizontal rotation. And that's where the streamlined vorticity seems, current, current seems to come from. So again, backing away to, the, to your basic question, the answer is we're keeping things as simple as we can to understand the phenomenon we're trying to study, to answer the questions we're trying to study. You can, and, and sometimes it makes sense to make it more complex, but you're asking a different question. So, um, but anyway, in the, to answer your question, yep, it's just incorporating air. It's as if the environment is frozen in time um, as it comes into the boundary. And you didn't ask this question, but you might ask, what is the, where does the cold pool air go? Does it also just exit the boundary? And it does. Uh, the boundary conditions that we have allow air to essentially come in or exit um, in, in a way that is uh, as uh, – it, it doesn't produce a lot of shocks or weird stuff uh, in the model. That – Boundary conditions uh, are always an issue because right when you're outside of their model, there's just nothing there. Um, it, one of the ways I deal with at least lateral boundary conditions is to make the domain as big as I can so that I don't really encounter much. But you always encounter the ground and you always encounter the top of the atmosphere. And where you choose the top and, and how you handle the ground, those things make huge differences in uh, the simulation results. And I could go on about that, but I won't. Okay, before we wrap up, somebody asked me about my garden. Ha! So I get to show you some pictures of my garden now. <laughs> so bear with me for a few minutes. If you're only here for the tornado content, you may leave. I don't mind. I won't take it personally. But let's... Uh, so this is for like about six weeks ago. Um, we had some roses this year that were incredible. And they're, uh, we've got some uh, some red roses and some and some white ones. And, and the, you're seeing them both here. I think they're dog roses and the other ones, the white ones, and I can't remember the names of the other one, but they came, we had a really good year this year in our garden and it's gotten better. Um, that, that, that video that I just showed you, um, that is, things have gotten more interesting. So let me kind of go through some of our, uh, some of the pictures here more up close. So here we go with some roses, uh, just some beautiful roses. We got three different kinds. We got some climbers, we got some ground roses, um, Let's see what else we got here. Some uh, spider wart, which is really cool. It blooms in the morning, is gone in the afternoon. Um, lots of lilies. Holy heck, we've got these, you know, I had this lily, which is now gone, um, where the flowers are gone, that was like seven feet tall. I had to like put supports and stuff. So it's been, <laughs> that's fun. Uh, when we moved into this house four years ago, it was landscaped with gravel and we had got that all taken out and then we created some soil with some compost and uh, that was a lot of fun, but it's, we're reaping, uh, our, our works, our, our efforts from the past are, are seem to be, um, paying off as we got a lot of nice flowers, um, geraniums, um, and, and lilies and all sorts of stuff. We got black eyed Susans now, sunflowers. Um, I could go on, but I won't. So anyway, Hey, thanks everyone. I'll try to do this more often. Um, I actually did this whole thing before and had a technical glitch. You're actually seeing the second version of this. I don't know how some of you YouTube people do this. Ah. Um, but anyway, take care, everyone. Um, I will be – there's more stuff coming, um, but I'm going to hold off on announcing it until some of this stuff becomes official. So um, some really cool stuff coming up. So you'll be hearing from me again pretty soon. Uh, everyone, you have a great week, great month, whatnot, and I'll talk to you soon.